we're going to show you something today that we believe most people aren't even aware of, and that is the forest that's behind us and also the memorial. In 1976, this was recognized as a natural landmark by the United States Park Service. We're in a 15-acre parcel that the Canfield family gave to the state of Vermont to preserve it. We can preserve the land, what, what we can't preserve is the trees, and that's one of the stories that we're going to talk about today, is what's going on with this old growth pine forest. The official name that the state has given it is the uh, Fisher Scott Memorial Pines. Uh, and I guess we'll uh, share with our folks the, uh, the piece about the forest and the piece about the memorial. Jim, you gotta let them know why we have so many uh, large trees that are down and uh, what's the significance of that? This tree in front of us it's has a to monster. be over 150 feet. It's about probably 150 feet tall, it was. Now it's the highest point is eight feet off the ground. But this is an, an old growth pine, uh, probably 250 to 300 years old. Wait a minute, this tree at one time before it fell was about 300 years old? Close to that, yeah. Yeah. And, we're, we're, and the, the, why, all the why, trees why, in here are the same age. All the pine trees are the same age. Why would this tree have fallen? Uh, is it naturally that it just came down or the uh, weather? Or? The biggest enemy to this stand of pines is lightning, and then standing dead and then falling over because of rot. This is a living entity, this forest right here. It, it has birth, it has death, and that's all natural. That's what's going on. You, we can preserve the land, we can't preserve the trees here. If we came here 50 years from now, and people would say, well, where are the large pines? Well, actually, they're behind us. Because in 1917, Dorothy Canfield Fisher and her husband were in France in World War I. Uh, her husband, John Redwood Fisher, was an ambulance driver for, for the American Army. And he would get time off and Dorothy and her son and daughter came to France to live so they could see her husband when he had time off. At that time, uh, you know, we were losing early wars like we always lose our, our, the early part of the wars. And the, uh, the supplies were coming from the United States and the packaging of the, all the food and the ammo and everything the Army needs, they needed lumber. And she said to the caretaker here, go cut the big pines for the war effort. So oh. from here to the road used to be occupied by large pine trees. All, all the large pine trees were cut up to this point right here. And so we have a, re this is 100 year old pines behind us because it was 100 years ago, the old trees were cut. So now we have a 100 year old forest, which is relatively young. That's, that's a good age, but it's young. Then we got a very old forest over yeah. here. So 50 years from now, this will be gone. We, we will never have pines in here again. Well, that's what I want him to ask me, because he John, ask him. You should look at this and say, look at the pine cones from this year. Maybe there's 50 seeds in every pine cone. There's 50 possible trees from that one, and there's thousands of them in here, thousands and thousands of them. But they don't grow, they, we can't grow any pines here, right? Because the trees are too tall. Because they're shade. Yeah, they, and they the, cut to, out the sun. They, that's right. To get pines established, you have to have sunshine. Yeah. And they're going to die one by one, so there'll never be an opening in here to get another pine started. Hey, Don, thanks for asking that question. Me, me Dad. <laughs> All right, we're ready to move? <laughs> okay. And leave that in, will you? So, Jim, at? it was uh, 2005 you brought me here for the first time. Uh huh. And uh, you said that my column had an error in it because what I had written about was not what was on the plaque here. And I had no idea there was a plaque here at all. And it was about that time that I read the book uh, Ghost Soldiers by uh, Hampton Sides. Hampton Sides, yeah, one yeah. of the best books I ever read. And I didn't have any, a guy gave it to me and he said, read it, you, you'll know why I gave it to you. And then I came across in the, in the name of James Canfield Fisher, Captain James. Dr. Canfield, Jim, Dr. Jimmy. Dr. Jimmy, as he was known, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and you said that, that up in the forest here, there was a memorial dedicated to Dr. Jimmy Fisher. Yep, yep. And he was... uh, I had no idea. And uh, so I did some research about it. And uh, uh, we found out that the plaque that had been here had the wrong date. It so did. when they put it in here in 1975, uh, it was wrong. 
And in 2006, we had the dedication of the new plaque, which is what we have here today. This particular site was um, picked because of that tree. The, that was the largest pine tree in the forest. And there's a little flat right here, so they picked this spot and this rock to put the plaque on. The plaque is about Dr. Jimmy Fisher. And, and Jimmy Fisher grew up here in Arlington. He uh, is the son of Dorothy uh, Canfield Fisher and John Fisher. Uh, he went on to Swarthmore College, uh, graduated in 1936, went on to Harvard Medical School, Jim, and got his uh, MD, uh, and then practiced medicine uh, for a few years. And then when the war broke out, he joined the uh, army, but he was transferred to the Philippines, uh, where he joined the 6th Ranger Battalion in 1945. Uh, in early 1945, the uh, Philippines had been invaded by the uh, General MacArthur's army, and they were pushing the Japanese forces completely out of the uh, area. What the Japanese were doing, they were killing our American POWs in the camps. So uh, Jimmy Fisher's uh, battalion, uh, headed up by Colonel Henry Musi of Bridgeport, Connecticut, Colonel Musi decided, we have a plan that we're going to go behind the enemy lines by 30 miles and rescue the, uh, the 513 prisoners at Camp Conabantu, which was a um, POW camp that had uh, well over 500 prisoners. But Some of them from the Bataan Death March. Well, so. let me go back. Uh, that's an important point, Jim. Uh, I really should go back to 1942 now, early 1942, when the Americans uh, had to surrender the uh, uh, bases at Corregidor and Bataan. Uh, General MacArthur was ordered out by President Roosevelt, uh, and over 60,000 Americans were held prisoner, and it went on a famous, infamous uh, death march. Uh, many of them died on it. Many of them were transported uh, back to Japan. Uh, many of them stayed on the Philippines. For three years, these people were in this camp. Over, uh, over 2,600 had already died at the camp. So the Americans were there right at the nick of time. Dr. Fisher, who did not have to go on the raid of the camp, decided to uh, volunteer to go on it because he knew that these people would be desperately ill after they'd been in camp for three years. Dr. Fisher was at the gate of the camp and a Japanese soldier shot off three mortar rounds and wounded about a half dozen rangers, including Dr. Fisher. Dr. Fisher was then carried by uh, a donkey cart uh, uh, to a, um, a, a, a field hospital, well, I shouldn't mm -hmm. even call it a field hospital, it was just a house. Uh, and they put two desks together with a sheet on the desk and they had to operate on them. And it was really, really uh, a tragic uh, scene because they did not have any of the medicines, they had really no anesthetics and so forth. Uh, but in the meantime, the battalion kept uh, taking the prisoners out, um, the POWs out to um, get them back behind uh, into American lines. Yep. Dr. Fisher stayed there with uh, uh, several other rangers, a couple of uh, uh, a Filipino doctor and a POW doctor took care of him together with Father Kennedy. Uh, uh, doctor, uh, Father Kennedy was a Jesuit and he stayed with him as well. The following day, they took Dr. Fisher, put him on a door and carried him for uh, many miles uh, in the, uh, through the jungle uh, to see if they could get to an airfield that was being made by the next village overnight to see if a Piper Cub could come in and rescue him and bring him back to the um, American bases. Uh, what was amazing to me is how all these villagers scraped together literally with their hands to create this airfield. Uh, the airfield was created. Unfortunately, the Piper Cub couldn't come in and Dr. Fisher died an hour later uh, that morning, I believe. Uh, he uh, was buried in a, uh, near a, um, uh, a special area of that uh, village, uh, and today uh, uh, he is buried at his grave was uh, his remains were removed, and he's now buried at the um, uh, American Cemetery in Manila. His um, mother, thanking the two doctors, uh, Philippine doctors who took care of him, right after the war, brought them to Harvard Medical School to get their degrees. And but, remember, remember the what they said about that that training they had. They said, if we knew bef when Jimmy arrived, what we know now after a year at Harvard, 
we could have saved them. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Jimmy, and, and, and he would always tell his troops to call him Jimmy. Uh, and uh, he received the uh, Silver Star and uh, the Purple Heart for what he had done. Yeah. Uh, how many people or prisoners were there? There were 513. All got out. All got One out. One person in the raid was killed. Uh, two rangers were killed, oh, two and, okay. and, and several uh, uh, people died on the way out because one had uh, advanced TB and the other had uh, advanced uh, heart uh, condition. Okay. But at the, at the gates right there, that's really sad. Oh, the, the, the one gate, person, the, uh, one person, that was Jimmy Fisher. Who was and born. they kept telling him, stop here. You could, okay, we're a mile away, wait here. No, we're half a mile away, no. And he kept coming and coming, and he got to the gate. And, and his last words were to uh, his um, first sergeant, did we get them all out? Yeah. And, uh, uh, but uh, an interesting, interesting side point, or uh, sidebar, uh, once the POWs got on board the, uh, the, um, uh, the General Anderson ship to come back to the States. The Japanese did everything they could to sink that ship. So the atrocities that took place in the camp would never be revealed. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the book, Ghost Soldiers, you can see why they were called ghost soldiers. That's I right. mean, they were just skin and bones. They were just, they had pictures of them being rescued and they were just, Skin and Bones, and I'd like to say again, a, a great book, Ghost Soldiers by Hampton Side. There was a movie also made. Miramax made a movie uh, two years later, 19, uh, 2008. Uh, uh, I, I believe Spielberg was involved in it, called The Great Raid. Yeah. And, and the it book really documents the... Yeah. Uh, the book is so much better, but both of them are good. Great well, Again, thanks for bringing me up here and sharing this with me. Sure. And, and this used to be my favorite spot for trees. And now I come here and I don't, I think of Jimmy Fisher. The trees are, they're still good, but not as good as Jimmy Fisher's story.